Scott. And I want to thank the members of the Sea Island Committee and the West United Methodist Church for this invitation. The honor is all mine. It is definitely all mine. I understand the thing for this year is take charge of your health. It is in your hands. And I think this is quite appropriate given the, given the state of the health care reform and the opposition to both from the, to the president and to health care reform. I think it's quite appropriate. I will start on the following topic. When Mr. Jenkins called me and talked to me about trying to do this, I thought to myself, okay. He said, I don't want it too long. I don't want it complicated. And so I thought to myself, how can I best do this knowing my love is to help um, African Americans and underserved populations? So I decided on this topic that I think you're all familiar with, and that's a term that's it's an African term. And it talks about it takes a village to raise a child. Yes. I'm saying it takes a village to raise a healthy child and a healthy adult and a healthy community. When we think of the village, we have to think of one, how are we going to define our village? Who is in your village? What requirements of folks that make up your village? If we define your village as your circle that surrounds you, that circle can include the church, it can include your family, it can include your workplace, it can include your community. But you have the decision to decide on who is in that circle and if they care about you and what happens to you. It is important about who is in your village because people in your village can affect your personal health habits, what you believe, how you respond to life, how you raise your children, how you take care of yourself. I want to share a quick story with you about my family and my village. My oldest sister fell in her apartment and was alone for three days. She was getting out of the bathtub so all she had around her, on her, was a towel. So for three days, she laid on her floor in the cold in upstate New York. My other siblings became concerned about her and said, it's strange because when we call her, she says, I'm cold and I'm hungry. So they're thinking, when you're cold and hungry, get a coat, eat. What's the problem? And so they became concerned again because she said she didn't feel too well. So they went to her house. And they found it just in time. Now that sister comes to South Carolina and stays when it's cold in New York. She came to South Carolina on a Wednesday. The following Wednesday, her only child and her daughter died of a massive heart attack in her apartment in, in Maryland. When I think in terms of my sister, and I think in terms of the village around my sister, my sister surrounded herself with people who were concerned about her. She took her medication. She had an unshakable faith in God. She was involved in a church. And she was involved in all the social activities. My niece, on the other hand, was involved in her church as well, but she surrounded herself with a different kind of people. So when we found my niece, in her apartment and had to go back and clean the apartment, we found one, she didn't take the medication. Two, uh, she didn't keep her doctor's appointments. And so when they found her Thursday, she was it. She'd gone to a game the Sunday. Monday, she went to work and complained of feeling like she was getting the flu. And what she really was was having these sickness and symptoms of a massive heart attack. Tuesday, she called and said, I don't feel that, I can't go in. I'm not coming in. And Wednesday is when she, either Wednesday or Thursday is when she passed. Because her employees found her 
the following day. So when I talk about the village, and you think in terms of folks that make up your circle, the first circle I'm going to say is the family. The family is like your skin. It's the first line of defense. But your family can also be challenging to you sometimes. Sometimes the people we love the most are the ones who give us the most headaches. Amen. And so, in terms of your family, one of the things about your family is that as we have families, we all share things together. We share beliefs. We share food habits. We share um, values. And so, as a result, when you talk to people about what they eat and how much they eat, you have to be careful because in reality, what you're doing is talking about somebody's mama. Because you have to understand behavior. When somebody does something over and over again, it becomes what? It becomes a habit. And habits become what? Culture. And people have a tendency to do what? Defend their culture. Because the culture talks about who you are. And that's really important. During the time that I was with Project Sugar, and we were all over the Sea Islands uh, trying to figure out which genes were responsible for diabetes in this particular population and obesity, we came across what we call um, the mutated gene. What that simply means is that all of us have genes. Genes are our blueprints for our bodies. It helps make up who we are. What we found among the Sea Islands of South Carolina was that some folks in our research study had what we call the UCP3 gene. The function of that gene is to what we call metabolize or use up fat in the body. Normal people use it fast, you have no problems. If you have that gene, that gene is mutated, then you have the you, then you have you are at risk for obesity. It doesn't mean you'll get obesity, it just means you're at risk. And so what it boils down to is that you may have a friend, a relative, who eat a lot and don't gain weight. If you don't eat as much, you gain weight. You can't get it off. All it means is that you simply have, if you have it, you work harder to get it off. And on the flip side of it is that if we had a family in this country, or if we had a descent like in Haiti, <coughs> folks who had that defect would die of starvation because it's a protective mechanism. We have not always been heavy in this particular population. We have not. We've been active. But when we sometimes keep the same diet and decrease the amount of activity, what ends up happening is that you have an unbalance here. When you have the obesity, what normally happens is that your body has to work harder. And why? It's because you got more space. You got to pump, 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 push so you get all over the body. Sometimes when you're obese, it doesn't get to all of the cells. And so what happens is that there are some cells that die or become injured. When those cells die and become injured, it ends up in illness, as if my niece. She had a massive heart attack, she was obese. She did not have anybody in her immediate circle that made her be conscious of, of her health and her health habits. think in terms of our families as again, over the years, we have begun to become lax in some things. We become lax in terms of how we raise our kids. It could be sometimes we want to be friends and not parents. And so as a result, and sometimes I'm guilty as well, sometimes I see little young guys with pants drop I just want to pull them up. Um, or I hear them use Profanity, I want to say, you can use another word. But what has happened nowadays is that I'm sometimes afraid because I'm not quite sure how they're going to respond to me. 
what happens when we do that is that the number of little black boys in prison does what? Increase. South Carolina, in South Carolina, we make up 30% of the population. So guess what we do in jails, our little black boys in jail? 58%. 58%. And here's what also is, is, is troubling. There was a study that used scores that little boys make on a standardized test in the third grade that can predict how many little boys are going to end up in jail. Now, to back to my, to my family in the village. Hope would come visit me in the summer sometime. And one summer she came to visit me. I had a job where we drove around the state a lot. And you might remember that I'm going to date myself, the eight track tapes. Yeah. <laughs> so we had, we had this eight track tape. And I, I'm a lover of classic songs from the drifters. So we would put the eight track tape in there and just play the drifters. And the, and the song I liked the most was the smoke gets in your eyes. So, yeah. Hope learned the words to all the songs. So when she went back to New York, she was in the post office one day, and she met what well, Trudy Goose and the Drifters came in. She didn't know who Trudy Goose was. Someone in the post office said Trudy Goose, and she remembered her aunt. So she says, you Trudy Goose and the Drifters? And he was like, yes. And so she said, I had to call my aunt. So she calls me and put him on the phone. He goes, hello? This is Trudy Goose and the Drifters. And so she got his, his, his autograph, and I still have it today. When I think about what think about what was around her, I'm sad because apparently something was lacking in her village. I told you that when we think about the village, the village is important for a whole lot of reasons. You may be in somebody's village, or somebody may be in your village, and as a result of that, we have some responsibilities about health that I'm going to share with you. With you. That as a village member, that we can begin to take responsibilities for. When you think of who makes up your village, you want somebody in your village. One, if you got some medication you don't know how to take, you want somebody to be able to, to, to do what? Help you. Yes. What does it mean take? with your main meal. What does it mean take twice a day? What does it mean take in the a.m. and the p.m.? What does that mean? Sometimes providers assume that you know what that means, and half of us don't. I spent 30 minutes trying to explain to my brother how to take this medication. He still didn't get it. And so it's not an easy task, but the point I'm making is that you got to have that circle around your people who got the information and who cares. In order to take charge of your health, you have to have the information. Let me talk a little bit about sugar diabetes. When you put your circle together, folks around you, if you have diabetes, or if you know somebody that has diabetes, and you're in their circle, there are certain things you might want to take note of. One is that if their blood sugar low, what are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? Do you know what to do? You need to know the signs and symptoms when somebody's blood sugar is low. Because if you don't, what do you think happens? That's right, you go into a coma. Again, back to my family. My other sister has had diabetes for over 40 years. And so she has what we call hypoglycemic unawareness. What that simply means is she's on insulin. What that simply means is that it comes to a point in time where your body does not recognize when your blood sugar drop. Now normal people, when your blood sugar drop, you start feeling what? Funny and you, you, you know you want to eat, you feel funny. She doesn't have that mechanism. So when it happens, bam, she had a wreck. With my mama in the car. 
And when she talked about she didn't understand it, remember, my poor mama in her 90s thought my sister was lying. And I had to try to make her understand. She didn't remember. She didn't remember. And my mom thought she was supposed to be telling a lie. She was this Christian that lied about the daughter not knowing that she had an accident. The other thing about diabetes is that <clears throat> if the person is on insulin, you want them to rotate those sites. You want them not to stick themselves in the same place all the time because when you do, that little spot is hard. And when that spot gets hard, it can't go nowhere. And then you're frustrated because your blood sugar is still high and you're taking your medicine. It used to be, in order to diagnose a person's diabetes, 140 was the cutoff. That's a change. It is now 126. So if your blood sugar is 126 on two separate occasions, you join the club. And if somebody, what we call, randomly take your blood sugar, which means it's stick at any time of the day, and it's 200, you definitely, it's a diagnosis. The other thing about it is that, when you think in terms of the circle and, and the folks that make it the circle, you have to understand how to take your medication, the pills. The pills work differently. Some work on the liver, some work on the pancreas, some make the insulin go into the muscles, but you got to understand what we call the mechanisms of medication. You got to take it correctly. You got to know should you take it on the stomach, take it with the first five meals, take it, you don't have to have, you just take it. You have to know that because when you have the medication and you're not taking it right, it's not going to make a difference. And again, you have the frustration of you can't get this together. Now, some of you may say, without the screw, I don't have sugar diabetes, so that doesn't matter to me. Well, that's okay. They may be, you may be in somebody's village. That's all right. You still need to know that. But then I'll ask you, well, what about your high blood pressure? What is that? Do you know that one in three people this country have not have high blood pressure. And that high blood pressure is simply the force of the blood against the, the arteries. And it is called a silent killer. And you know why? Because you don't feel anything. By the time you feel something from high blood pressure, it is almost too late. When you have high blood pressure, it puts a strain on your heart and everything else. 140 over 90 is supposed to be high blood pressure, but a lot of us think that's normal. What's normal is 120 over 70. Now, anything from 130 to 139 over 80 and 89 is what we call pre-hypertensive. You gotta be careful. But the catch is, is that if you have diabetes, it has to be 130 over 80 or less because you put yourself at risk otherwise. The other thing is you want to be able to share if you're in somebody's village is the thing about cholesterol. Cholesterol is something tiny, it's, a, it's fat that's in someone's blood vessels. It comes from certain foods that are high in fats, and when you eat too much of that food, then you put yourself at risk to have a high cholesterol. The total cholesterol should be 200 or less. But the thing about the cholesterol is, there are two types. There are two types. It's important. One is good, it's bad. The bad one is called LDL. And I'm a, an L for lousy. But just remember lousy. Because it is the predictor of heart disease. It is when you have the plaque and the fat stick to the walls of your arteries and the blood can't pass. 
the goal for the lousy or LDL is 100 and less. The other cholesterol is the HDL. That's the good one. It's the high density. It helps get cholesterol fat out of your veins. And the goal for that one Tell you wrong. It's less than 40. Now, when I think about processed sugar, when we used to draw people's blood for the, the, the sugar study, and at that time I didn't know what this meant. But there would be times that we would have to draw the blood and they'd be sitting there, okay, until we put it, either spin it down or, or, or put it on ice. And you would see fat on the top of the blood. And that was simply the cholesterol, that's the fat. And a lot of our patients had high cholesterol. But with James, the good thing is, we talk about the good thing, we said, talk about something good, is that what we found among our particular population was that we had good HDL. And so black women had good HDL. You didn't understand why. They had high blood pressure, but the HDL was good. And then you say, okay, now that's good. Talk about something good. Talk about something happy. That's just what Jenkins would say. It's just too sad. When we talk about all the things that's wrong, sometimes we can't get it together to do anything or make any changes. And that's true. What I do know is that there are two other things you need to know when you're in somebody's circle. Heart attack signs and strokes. Because we are a proud, beautiful, strong, resilient people. We are self reliant. We have taken care of ourselves. We still can do it, and the pride is there. We need to take that same pride, take that same determination and turn it around so that when you are in somebody's circle or in, you, in somebody's village, somebody's in your village, you need to know what it's like if they think they're having a stroke. Do the voice get slurred? Do they get weak on one side? Do they seem non-coherent? You need to have some sense of it. And let me just tell you this. Three things you can do when you're not quite sure what's going on. One, you ask them to do what? Smile. If they smile, that means that there is probably not a stroke. Because if you're into a stroke, you can't smile. You get paralyzed. Okay? The other thing is, you ask them to say something. Say the name. Say the day of the week. Because if you can talk, you might be okay. If they can't talk, then it's be concerned. The, the third thing is, you ask them to raise their hands. Because if they can't raise their arms up and they're weak, you best call 911. Because the sooner you get to the hospital and get the kind of medication to break up the stroke, the better off you are. The last thing is that in, in terms of heart attacks, and I think again about hope, is that sometimes you know, like women, um, assume the responsibilities of caretakers of everybody. And sometimes, exactly. And we leave ourselves unprotected. We have all the stress. We are trying to save the world. And what ends up happening is, is that we, we end up being the ones that's having a stroke. We end up being the ones that have the breast cancer and found out about it too late. When you think in terms of a heart attack, there are lots of little telly signs. And sometimes we get it confused with indigestion 
or in Hope's case, she thought she had flu. Because if you looked at the things she bought that Monday, she bought things like hop syrup, palm drops, aleve, orange juice. Because she was thought she had the flu. She was aching, but she was having this heart attack all three days and didn't know it. So what I leave you with is this. We can do this. We stand on the shoulders of great folks. We survived for so long and so many things. It is not an impossible task. As I continue to do research among folks on the sea islands of South Carolina, I'm always mindful of trying to make a difference. The latest set of research, I hope I can say this, Mr. Jenkins, is that I'm trying to put together three focus groups. Because what we're trying to do, and a focus group is when people in a group, four or five people, talk about a particular topic. I want to know, one, how people take care of their diabetes, the sugar diabetes. What gets in the way? What are the problems? And how can we fix that? And how, at some point, can we have education materials that people can use to improve their life? And so what I like to do is I have some cards I want to leave um, with Reverend Scott. And so if there's anybody that's interested, um, you just put your name on it and send it because they are, they're cars that have the stamp on them already. And so you put your name on it and you just send it to me and we go from there. I am so honored to be here today. I hope that things that I said make some difference in your life. I hope that as we think in terms of our village. Who is in the village? Who make up your village? What do you require of people in your village? And how are you going to be a participant in somebody's village? Will make a difference. We have a responsibility to take charge of our own health. We can do that. We can understand what a low blood sugar is. We can understand the signs and symptoms of a heart attack, or a stroke, or high blood pressure. We can do this. And what did Obama say in 2009? Yes, we can. Thank you very much.